Good day and welcome to the GEO Institute fourth annual live streaming web conference. Today's topic will be embankments, dams and slopes and the program facilitator is Ben Luchinski. This is an audio web conference. You will hear the presentation through your computer speakers and there will be a PowerPoint presentation that will be shown throughout the meeting. You can ask a question through the online web conference tool at any point during the session by clicking on the ask button on the left of your screen, type your question into the box and hit the send button to submit your question. I'd now like to turn the floor over to today's facilitator, Ben Luchinski. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thank you all for being here today for our web conference for Embankment Dance and Slopes. This is our first of three and we'll have one tomorrow and the next day, so I'd encourage all of you to uh, spend some time and see some of the interesting stuff that our colleagues are doing. So uh, today, first I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, our, our sponsor, Keller. Um, the companies of Keller in North America, that they're uniquely positioned to handle some of the most complex geotechnical projects nationwide. They uh, include all their services in one contract, and they reduce risk and ensure all aspects of a project are met on time and on budget. And Keller is, is really responsible for providing the resources and support to ensure that these web conferences have come to you today. So we're very grateful for that. So on to the program. Today we'll have four presenters. Uh, the first presenter will be Mike Beattie, who will talk about static and permanent deformation analyses. Gata Alithi. Uh, evaluation of erosion rates and, and coarse grain materials using LIDAR. Uh, Suji Sumasa, Sumasandram, and he'll be talking about actually a, a different presentation that's shown there, landslide characterization, stability, and mitigation at the FRB landfill. It's going to be interesting. And finally, uh, I'll end the, the day with will it stay, will it go, use of LIDAR to assess slope instability. So with that said, just uh, briefly like to introduce you to our presenters. So uh, this is Mike Beatty. He is a principal engineer of his own company. He'll have our first presentation. This is Gata. As she works at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, she'll give us her second presentation. Suji, he'll be giving us her third presentation on a, a FRB landfill. And finally, the last one is me. So with that said, we'll get started with our first presentation, which would be Mike. So Mike, whenever you're ready, I've uploaded your slides, and you should be good to go. Uh, thank you, Ben, and uh, thank you all for, for attending. I'll be talking this morning about uh, deformation analyses, both static and dynamic, but I should let you know that most of my experience and education deals more on the seismic area deformation analyses. So a lot of my examples may tend towards that, although I, a lot of the, the same concerns, challenges, and capabilities apply both to static and, and dynamic deformation analyses. I'll be starting a little bit on just covering some basics. So I apologize for those of you out there that are familiar with this type of work. Um, that it, it may be a bit, uh, uh, you know, going over things that seem a bit simple but then moving on and discussing some, some very specific challenges that happen in these type of analyses, things to look out for, things that are just a, a little bit more uncertain. Anyway, I've, I've shortened nonlinear deformation down to NDA, just to uh, make it a little bit easier to talk. The, the framework for those analyses are, is that they're really focused on being mechanics-based and trying to get that aspect of the physics down as well as possible really focusing primarily starting with, with Newton's equations, F equals MA, trying to satisfy that relationship throughout your whole analysis. Um, using stress-strain relationships, essentially a mechanical behavior that, that stress and strain are related, although that can be related in a very complex way. And then the displacement compatibility, so that when you're trying to evaluate a large structure that you're doing it in, in a reasonable and consistent way so that all parts of the structure interact uh, with other parts in an appropriate manner. NDAs currently are primarily for continua, which means that you're, you're representing a, a soil, even though it's a, a 
a com composite of a whole bunch of different particles, you're representing it as if it was a solid. Um, there are there are definitely research coming up and becoming more practical where you're removing beyond continua, but most NDA now are, are done with that assumption. Typically done in a finite element or finite difference framework. And most of us have probably heard finite element when we're thinking about structures. And it's probably good to keep that in mind because when we're doing an NDA analysis, we're really just doing a structural analysis, a nonlinear plasticity-based structural analysis. We just have some really strange materials. Currently, most of these are done in two dimensions, although 3D is starting to you know, become more common in, in practice. There's a lot of challenges there, both in computing time and, and developing all the necessary equations, but it's, it's something that is, is coming forward. Quite often, when they're in advanced analysis, they're fully coupled effective stress analyses. And what that really is talking about is that the the response of the pore fluid is an important part of the whole analysis. Uh, dilation and contraction, but you're estimating through the, the main equations for the soil skeleton, that dilation and contraction affects generation or, or, or decrease in pore pressures. And you can also couple it with a, a seepage analysis that runs along in sequence with the mechanical analysis. So you have pore water flow uh, coming into or out of elements in response to the gradients. Uh, a finite element mesh, or in this case, finite difference, looks something like this. You have a, this is a, a slope with various different soil units, and you've represented this particular stratigraphy with a number of different small elements. Each element you de define properties for, and the, the numerical techniques knits all these different elements together to give you an idea of what the whole response is. Um, looking at just one small portion of the model, you can see how, how different uh, soil types shown by different colors are represented by the different elements. And within each element, you establish those mechanical relationships or constitutive equations. And those can be really quite complex. If you look over here, that the figure on the right is a stress versus strain prediction and quite complex behavior for soils. So. This whole process needs to try to develop or, or adopt equations for soils that can really mimic what, how we think they're going to behave. And some common features in geotechnical NDA, and I, I'd say these are features that uh, when they're present, it's more likely to do this level of analysis to try to understand what's really happening. And it's quite often when you have something complex and that can be complex soil behaviors like liquefaction or cyclic softening of clays or really highly compressible materials. You're likely to do an NDA if you expect to have uh, large strains or large displacements and you need to understand how those displacements might evolve and generally what their magnitude might be. And they're really good for soil structure interactions if you have piles, walls, remediation elements, uh, different types of foundation elements those things can be tied in with the soil grid and you can get a, a very good idea of the interaction between the two. And then generally these are used in a performance-based engineering framework. They're, they're not used to give you factors of safety. They're used to give you an improved idea of how the structure is going to, to behave, how it's going to be performed, and then that's compared to whatever your criteria is for that particular behavior. Uh, a few examples, this is a 2D NDA of an embankment dam with an embedded tower. Uh, when this dam was evaluated, a number of different 2D sections were analyzed to get an idea of how the dam, whole dam might perform and some idea of how it might interact 3D. In this case, the section is through the outlet tower, where the outlet tower was, was modeled using a simple beam element with and also model with consideration that the, the soil would be able to move somewhat around the tower, that it was not essentially a wall. It was, you know, it was a somewhat, um, somewhat independent structure. And it was, in this case, it was a very useful analysis because it changed uh, perspectives on how 
this particular soil structure interaction was going to perform. Uh, before the analysis was done, the basic thinking was that loads on the tower were going to be inertial based. And, you know, very clearly the analysis demonstrated that that wasn't the right point of view, that the loads on the tower, even though it was a fairly strong earthquake happening, they were all going to be displacement based. That if, this, if the soil moved, the loads on the tower were going to be very extreme. If the soil didn't move, the tower was fine. So it was, it was very critical to the overall evaluation. Here's another case where analyses were performed adjacent to a submerged slope. So in, in this case, there were some very large, several hundred foot high transmission towers on top of the slope needed to know if those towers could, could satisfy their performance criteria, which was, which was pretty tight. Uh, the top of the tower was only allowed to move, I believe it was on the order of, of a foot, a foot and a half, which considering how tall they were, I believe these were 300 feet, that doesn't involve that, you know, doesn't allow very much rotation at the base. So this analysis first was used to say, you know, to confirm that yes, we have a problem here. There's soft soils, a submerged slope, and we have tight constraints. And then it was looking at various remediation options to see what what would really be required to confidently reduce the rotations down. And another case of, of slope. In this case, the, the slope was going to be covered up with an MSC wall, and on top of the wall were, were going to be uh, tracks for a transportation system. Um, the, that wall was built a bit further into the picture, but on the, on the left side of the existing tracks. And a real interesting thing about this was that the wall was founded on top of uh, some somewhat liquefiable sands, but below that it was soft clays. And the cost-effective remediation for it was to support this wall onto a raft of timber piles. And the question for the analysis was, is that going to be sufficient when essentially these, these piles are going to be bounded down into clays, which are not particularly stiff? And you can see from the figure on the right, these are just contours of estimated displacement, and you can see the the near vertical piles shown by the dark lines, and then in the blue, that area is where the MSC wall is, that during the analysis, it shows quite a bit of rotation of, the, of those piles because of the softer soils and a, a fair amount of movement of the MSC wall. And in this case, it was useful because they had a performance criteria that was set based on their good judgment. They did the analyses and got a good idea of how much it was going to rotate. Then they went back and looked at their performance criteria to fine tune it. What did they really need to accomplish with that performance? And between those two aspects, looking at performance and looking at the results of the analysis, they were able to come up with a good solution for, for this project. And one last case, this is, this is for a static loading. And one of the analyses that I really found pretty interesting it was a hydraulic fill dam that was functioning well. It was an older dam. And, but if you can see up where it says new load, there was a small buttress being placed on the downstream slope. And it produced quite a bit of deformation, much more than was expected, including some cracking. So the analysis that was performed was trying to understand you know, what actually happened in this case. You know, what caused the deformations, and does anything need to be done to fix it up? It was really a, a detailed case of, of of a static analysis where we had information from odometry tests on on the compressibility of the soils. We could calibrate models to that, and we could come up and match pretty well the model with what was seen in inclinometers and, and the timing of displacements and all that. It was really quite a fascinating project. And, and eventually led to some uh, modest remediation of, of, the, of the slope of the dam. So what are the objectives of, of NDA? And, and one is, is really to try to efficiently and reliably address the needs of the project. And that could be safety evaluation. It could be um, if, analyzing for displacement-based loads, seismic performance, uh, settlements, 
the primary objective really comes down to satisfying concerns of the stakeholders and the decision makers. And that can be the owner, it can be other engineers that are dependent on the results because the analyst is generally a part of a team and information goes both ways. And people are going to de be dependent on the, the work and, and judgment of the analyst. There's reviewers and there's regulators. And almost all of these stakeholders have a, a question is how good are the estimates? You know, they, they like the capabilities, but they're, a lot of times they're a little bit unsure about um, how reliable they are. And that's, that's an important part of the process is to deal with that uncertainty. Some common challenges and probably the biggest challenge is something that really doesn't have anything to do with the analysis at all. And it's the site characterization without really understanding what your site is what the soils are there, what the likely behaviors are to the loading that you're anticipating. Without really understanding all that, the analysis is is really not very useful. It's it's um, just kind of kind of guessing without enough backup to really make it a reliable analysis. The constitutive modeling, you know, defining those stress strain relationships within each element. Uh, that's difficult trying to select the right one, understanding what it, their capabilities and weaknesses are. Validating, getting some idea on the uncertainty and, and reliability of the analysis, and then directly addressing those uncertainties. Some common materials, behaviors to be addressed. Uh, following the work of Professor Zidris and Belanger, it's kind of nice to categorize them and to behaviors that affect clay-like soils and those with sand-like soils. The clay-like, you're often worried about uh, just softening, uh, remolding if the strains get large. Uh, stress history and OCR become really important to try to estimate during the stress characterization for clay-like soils. For sand-like soils, uh, strength and stiffness is key. If you have uh, dynamic loading or if you have very soft uh, or very loose sands and you have static loading, you start becoming worried about uh, liquefaction and, and what the strengths are going to be after liquefaction, those kinds of effects. common site investigation tools and it, this is a bit of a perhaps a, a wish list of, t of common tools I tend to see all these in projects when we're moving towards doing an NDA unfortunately we don't see perhaps all of them uh, in a project there's usually some things that are, are missing that you find out when you're doing the analysis it would be really nice to have but just for clay like soils you know see CPT is pretty common Shear wave velocity measurements from geophysics are becoming more common, but don't see enough vein shears, which really can give you information on um, the, the peak strength of, of clays as well as the strength after remolding, which is always a, a question that comes up if you start having large deformations in a, in a clay deposit. Uh, about the site characterization, uh, just a, a little note here saying be careful with undisturbed samples. Uh, with the, it seems to be more common now to be doing uh, strength testing, I'm thinking strength, cyclic strength testing particularly on samples obtained from the field. And I think part of that was driven by understanding the importance of say normally a low, low OCR clays that they can cyclically soften and we can get pretty good samples from those most of the time. So we could take them in the lab and actually get some a lab based understanding of what's going on. But it's more and more being extended to, to sandy soils, which I have a big concern about. Uh, just testing a sandy soil in the lab and thinking that it really corresponds to what's out in the field, giving all the potential for um, disturbance, excuse me, disturbance during uh, sampling, void ratio changes. And just to kind of highlight that, this is the picture photo up here is an example of a sand that was taken out, called undisturbed, and was tested. And I don't think I put much reliance on that. And, and fortunately, uh, once it was reviewed by the engineers, there wasn't any reliance placed on it. But kind of a waste of money in that point. And then the X-ray shown at the bottom how samples uh, really can be highly, highly fractured in a, in a tube, and need to be aware of that uh, when you're selecting your samples.
spatial variability in site characterization, that's that's a difficult aspect of characterizing a site to, characterizing a site to deal with. You know, we're all familiar with looking at, say, a, a plot of a penetration resistance from either CPT or, or SPT and seeing a wide scatter and trying to figure out what that actually means. Uh, Montgomery and Belanger have done some really interesting work where they have done a set of analyses doing randomly uh, variable properties within the analyses and trying to compare those results with what what you get if you assume uniform properties within a, a unit, um, which is which is much more common practice. And, and have come up with some uh, some good recommendations generally to use something less than the median representation of a, of a deposit when trying to come up with uniform properties. So, you, it, for example, that you wouldn't, if you had a sand layer, that to get the best estimates of deformations, you wouldn't use the median below count, you'd use something less than that, say the 35th percentile. But a, key, a real key to some of their work is really when you're doing the site characterization to always consider the geologic setting and the deposition processes. That, that really gives you a basis for understanding how things may vary within the deposit to be able to extrapolate what little information you have to come up with a good site characterization. Uh, this is just an example of, of Montgomery and uh, Belanger's work looking at stochastically varying properties. And then on the right here, this graph compares what they see in the analyses doing the a set of stochastic stochastic analyses, and then some deterministic uniform properties and seeing how the comparison varies quite a bit, but generally the 35th is a good value for a lot of these, 35th percentile for properties. Uh, potential behaviors, that follows on from the site characterization, but it's really important. You need to identify before an analysis what you think is most likely to happen. The analysis doesn't really tell you what's going to happen if, if you go in blindly. You need to know, you know, are, is this a, a situation where static liquefaction might happen or cyclic softening or a remolding of clay after you have static liquefaction of a, of a sandy deposit? All those things need to be identified beforehand so that you can set up the analysis properly. Making sure critical behaviors are addressed. This is a, a, an example where residual strengths or post liquefaction strengths of, of sandy soils, it's important to make sure that that's captured in your analysis if you're concerned about liquefaction of, of sandy soils. A, a lot of constitutive models, those stress strain relationships, can do a pretty good job of, of estimating when you get high pore pressures and when you get initial softening, but they don't directly incorporate the residual strengths that you would get from field behavior. And here is an example of, of evaluating the lower San Fernando Dam, which is seen over here on the right. There was a large post-liquefaction slide. If you, on the left, if you, the top figure here shows the deformed shape of the analysis of the dam in the analysis at the end of shaking. And you can see that doesn't represent very well what actually happened. If you come in after that analysis and you say, okay, I see what sounds liquefy, I'm going to put reduced strengths according to uh, my favorite residual strength relationship and see what happens. Then you start getting this flow slide behavior. So the real concern or challenge here is, is understanding the constitutive model and knowing that with its framework, it doesn't directly impose those um, post-liquefaction strengths, the liquefied strengths that we've seen in the field, and that that needs to be done uh, as, a, as a separate analysis. I can constitute a model simulate expected behaviors. On the right here are five different constitutive models. All of them are, are really should be trying to simulate this graph over here on the left, which is based on a lot of lab test data. And you can see how the constitutive models are kind of all over the place. They, they represent that data in, in different ways and some better than others. Fortunately, this is, this is a problem that's been recognized for about 10 years now, so things are getting better. But it's still a, a case where there are many behaviors out there that 
most models either don't handle well or it's kind of spotty and you need to understand the models that you're picking, are they really able to handle the behaviors that are most important to you, uh, the situation at hand. And it, here's a ex quick example where one of the analyses that did not have the, the, this K-alpha behavior handled very well, it was analysis was done, the slope was found to be stable, and yet upon review it was found out it was only stable because the, the constitutive model was not predicting this behavior properly. Uh, remolding of, of clay-like soils. Uh, another you know, key problem, key challenge that comes up that we don't understand as well as we could, although research is going on on how to be able to model this type of behavior. But it is pretty important, even with moderately sensitive soils. Um, this is an example of the analysis of the Fourth Avenue slide up in, in Anchorage from the 1964 Great Earthquake. And most of the displacement, displacements that occurred happened because of this remolding. So it is something that, that does occur in the field and that, that needs to be addressed by, if you have this kind of situation, by whatever constitutive model you have selected. Um, Post-liquefaction behavior, a uh, lot of, of, of challenges in this. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the residual strengths and we plotted over here are different representations or different relationships used for estimating residual strengths and you see there's quite a bit of a scatter. So that uncertainty needs to be dealt with when you have this type of situation. Most of the more advanced constitutive models, they, are, they handle things such as contraction and dilation of the soil skeleton. And with that coupled analysis, that affects pore water pressure. And if you have an area of the soil that dilates, the pore pressures can drop quite a bit and it can become very really strong and, and stiff. And there's the possibility when that happens that you have either overestimated the, the effects of dilation and you can, you can stabilize the slope because you have a part of the toe that's dilating or that you've underestimated uh, the potential for pool water to flow into that zone and essentially erase the effects of dilation. So complex constituent models are great, but you need to follow through and make sure that in the end result that what it's telling you is, is something that you believe can happen out in the field and that you haven't missed a, a good mechanism or a, a reasonable mechanism that would affect the displacements. Uh, always need to assess and confirm behavior for simple load paths. Here is uh, simulations of, of direct simple shear tests, in this case, cyclic simple shear. Uh, often don't have those from laboratory tests unless you're dealing with the plastic soil. But at least you need to make sure that your constituent model is doing, uh, predicting behaviors that are, are consistent with what we see in literature and in general testing. Uh, and a, a challenge about that is, if you remember in the previous slide, those stress paths that we, we calibrate to, that we confirm their behavior for, those behaviors are really simple. But here's an example of a, of, a, of a dam and just picking out an element in the upstream slope of the dam and looking at what the behaviors are. We have stress strain over here, and we have stress path on, on the lower curve on the right, and they're really quite complicated. So in, in, in some way, you need to recognize that complication, but you also need to evaluate it within a 2D response and say, yes, there's nothing uh, that does not look, there's nothing unreasonable in the estimates. So that's an important aspect. Uh, you need to do numerical simulations of, of the laboratory test, field case history, centrifuge test uh, to get a, a a good idea that your modeling approach is actually working. A lot of times this is done well before an actual analysis is done. But if it hasn't been done in the constitutive model and modeling approach that, that you're adopting, it's something that really should be done to help validate the approach and give give the other stakeholders a, a good sense of confidence and understanding of what the, the modeling capabilities are. Uncertainties is, is something to face, uh, face up to, you know, in a transparent way. 
many sources of uncertainty. Site characterization is a key one. Uh, constitutive models, all these different stress strain models, you know, they, they have strengths and weaknesses, and it's important to know what those weaknesses are. Uncertainties in the implied loadings. How, how well do you know what's going to happen in the future that you're designing for? Uh, parametric studies are really needed, which is where you, you change key variables and you see what the, the effect is on the performance. It's, it's a very simple way to, to help understand and put some limits on the uncertainties, at least some of the uncertainties. A risk analyses when the project importance demands it and when there's budget, uh, they're, they're a great way to evaluate these uncertainties in a formal setting. Um, they're not, don't often tell you everything you want, but it really helps you focus in on, on what's important and, and what the potential impact of those important factors are. Here's an example of parametric studies where we're changing a, a parameter uh, reasonable between two different analyses produce somewhat of a different response mechanism. So it's important to do those to understand fully how your structure might be behaving. Another set of parametric studies, which was which was done near the end of a, a program, and it showed that all these different parameter changes produced results that were pretty consistent with each other, and that gave quite a bit of confidence. Documentation. Again, trying to meet that a goal of being transparent and giving um, a good understanding to the stakeholders of what the analysis means and, and how it should be interpreted. You know, it's, it's key to give transparent and complete documentation. Um, there's a paper that, that Professor Boulanger and I uh, published in the USSD conference in 2016, which provides a pretty comprehensive list of things that you can document. document or should document for a key project. Not all those are perhaps uh, important for every project, but it gives you a good list of things to consider about. So a conclusion, some perspectives on, on NDA. A, a primary value is improved understanding of the potential important, important performance, uh, what the key issues are, uh, what the likely displacement mechanisms are, and how different remediation efforts or design changes could impact that performance. It's really dependent on the site characterization. It requires knowledgeable participants, um, either the analyst or, or somebody involved, um, knowledgeable for somebody that's interpreting the results for use. They need to be knowledgeable about uh, the limitations. And then transparent and complete documentation is, is really essential. That, that was the end of my presentation. I, I thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm, I'm willing to, or interested to see if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, I'm ref refreshing the question list right now. And uh, I don't see anything at this moment. Um, if, you, uh, if you can, audience, uh, if you have any questions, please send them my way. And I'd be happy to ask them. I did. I do have one question that I get asked quite a bit, and that is, you know, how accurate these analyses can be in terms of, of the displacement magnitudes um, and and patterns. And it, right, but the first answer it always comes down to it depends. It depends on that quality of the site characterization. It depends on the, the decisions that were made in the modeling process for the for the best constitutive model selected and. And there's quite a long list. But for analyses that follow good practice in, in all those different areas, and perhaps not perfect, but they follow the good accepted practice, a, a kind of rule of thumb is that the magnitudes are generally within a factor of about two, which is similar to a lot of magnitude displacements, sorry, which is similar to a lot of other approaches. But what the value of the NDA is that it, it provides that kind of a little bit better than rough estimate of displacement but it gives you a lot more information about how the structure is going to respond to the, the loading of concern. So that's, I think, where the real value comes in. That's great. Um, still haven't received any questions, Mike, but uh, I think we have your contact information, um, and I would encourage the audience to, to chat with Mike if they want to ask an expert about numerical modeling. So. Uh, with that said, thank you so much, Mike.
I think we'll move on to our next presentation. All right. On deck. So our next presentation's from, oh, pardon me. Our next presentation is from uh, Gada Lithi from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers about evaluation of erosion rate of coarse grain materials using LIDAR. So, Gada, I'll hand it yes. over. Okay. Um, hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Gada. As Ben mentioned, uh, I'm a research engineer at the Engineer Research and Development Center uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, and you can see the title of my presentation. I will be talking about some experiments that uh, we ran uh, to evaluate the erosion rate of uh, sands and gravels uh, mixes um, with a, a new uh, LIDAR technology. And <clears throat> before I start, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Mr. John Murphy and Dr. Maureen Corcoran. Um, so just to give you a background um, on this research, uh, it has been reported that um, approximately 60% of, um, of failures, of dam failures, are directly or indirectly related to dam overtopping. So to improve the course practice in evaluating the flood risk assessment of both dams and levees, um, uh, related to a breach by overtopping failures, we wanted to uh, uh, to understand the soil uh, erodibility, especially for non-cohesive materials that are sands and gravels. And these materials can compromise can uh, comprise the outer shell layers of dams or of levees that are constructed with this material uh, to uh, estimate a realistic time. Uh, with to uh, realistic time for the uh, breach and for the uh, breach channel uh, widening. And we can do this by determining the erodibility parameters, uh, which are the erosion rate and the critical shear of such materials, as well as evaluating the overtopping erosion mechanism of the coarse grain materials. Uh, Either it's a surface erosion or head cut erosion. And um, if you're familiar with the erosion mechanism, surface erosion is typically associated with coarse grain materials. Uh, head cut erosion is associated with uh, fine grain materials. Um, the head cut erosion is probably studied more for fine grain materials, and we use the axis shear stress uh, model uh, to for, for such evaluation of the head cut erosion. However, the transition between uh, those two mechanisms is um, is not very well established. Like what type of percent fines or uh, percent uh, or maximum uh, grain size. Uh, will uh, uh, will change the mechanism of overtopping erosion from head cut to um, to surface erosion, as well as assess the axis shear uh, erosion model, uh, its applicability to coarse grain materials, and the the axis shear uh, model is uh, used for fine grain materials. Um, so. The, the study approach is we uh, uh, designed 12 non-cohesive uh, non soil mixtures uh, that are grouped by their D50 and uh, fines content. So we have three or four uh, soil mixes with the same D50 but with varying percent fines um, and percent clay. Uh, the D50, uh, the the uh, for this study, uh, uh, ranges between 2 millimeters and 50 millimeters. Uh, the maximum size between 5 millimeters and 150 uh, millimeters in, in inches from less than quarter of an inch to, uh, to about 6 inches. Uh, the percent fines between 0 and 15 percent and the clay content between 0 and 5 percent. And to determine the erosion parameters and due to the uh, scale limitation of current existing laboratory equipment uh, for soil erodibility measurements, we have the JET test um, as well as the whole erosion test or the EFA. Due to the scale limitation of this equipment, uh, we initiated um, 
a, a larger scale test box to determine those erosion uh, parameters. Uh, each soil mix of the 12 mixes uh, is uh, compacted in the test box and subjected to variable flow rates, uh, resulting in variable uh, bed shear, and the test box is placed in, uh, in the flume, as I will uh, show you in later slides. Um, also, since erodibility of coarse grain material could be a very quick process, we needed a measurement means that could capture this process in real time under flowing conditions. Uh, so we used the shallow water LiDAR uh, system, which is a relatively new technology uh, that utilizes two laser beams reflected simultaneously on the water surface as well as the soil surface. And then as a second uh, phase of this uh, study, uh, we are uh, planning to run overtopping erosion tests on 1.2 meter or four foot uh, high levee models constructed with the same 12 uh, soil mixes to assess the erosion mechanism. Uh, the results I'm presenting uh, today uh, are for four mixes. Uh, there are, um, uh, the name uh, 4, 5, uh, uh, 6 mod, and 6A mod. Uh, uh, mix 4 uh, has no fines. Uh, mix 5 has 5% 5 fines in 2% clay. Mix 6A, uh, 6 mod and 6A mod, they have 15% fines in 5% clay. Uh, but the difference between the last two mixes is that the maximum size uh, of the first is 12.5 millimeters and the second is 25 uh, millimeters. The plasticity index for uh, the fine uh, in these mixes uh, is 8%, uh, with the liquid limit being 26%. And the, class the classification of these soils uh, range between a well-graded gravel or GW and a clay gravel uh, GC. Uh, we ran standard compaction uh, test uh, proctor on uh, on these four uh, mixes, uh, where uh, the optimum water content was uh, found to be between six six and seven percent, and the optimum dry density or the maximum dry density between 19 and 25. Uh, percent, uh, 25, I'm sorry, 25.5 kilonewton uh, per cubic meter, or between 120 and 137 uh, pounds per cubic foot. Uh, the density was noticed to increase with increasing the fines content uh, or the same D50 and the same uh, maximum size. Uh, we uh, ran the, uh, the, the, these uh, tests with the soil mixes compacted in the test box at near optimum uh, density and, uh, and water content. Uh, this slide here shows the test setup uh, uh, where the, uh, the test box is embedded in the uh, flume uh, floor. Uh, the, the flume is 18.3 meter or 60 foot uh, long uh, with 0.9 uh, meter wide and 0.46 uh, meter high, or about uh, a foot and a half, uh, and it can be tilted uh, between minus 2% to plus 8%. Uh, the test box is uh, built in a false uh, floor, um, as I mentioned, in the flume bed, with dimensions about uh, with a length of 1.22 uh, meters, uh, or four foot, and uh, um, 0.46. Uh, or 1.5 uh, foot uh, wide, where the flow was contracted from the upstream of the flow to the uh, upstream, of, uh, upstream of the plume to the upstream of the box, and the, the box depth is 0.18 meter or uh, 7 inches. Uh, this slide here shows the uh, LiDAR. Um, uh, system, which was mounted on top of the flume uh, in the scanning track. Uh, the LiDAR transmits uh, two laser beams uh, that reflect on uh, both the soil and water surfaces simultaneously. Uh, the pulse rate of the laser beams uh, is 8 kilohertz. Uh, that means that it can take up to 8,000 uh, measurements in one second, 
with one centimeter vertical and horizontal resolution. So the uh, scanning uh, data uh, was uh, were uh, grouped in bins uh, that are uh, one centimeter in uh, in length. And the, a motor controller is programmed to control the longitudinal and transverse uh, scanning speed. Uh, the encoder uh, records the X and Y coordinates of each uh, scan point. And the LiDAR, uh, the LiDAR uh, system and control computer need to be connected to the same local uh, network. Uh, this slide here shows the picture of the LiDAR, the control laptop, and scanning tracks. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the soil uh, mix being compacted in the test box. Uh, the LiDAR scans uh, the test box in eight passes uh, or tracks in the middle third of the box, or uh, 0.18, uh, about seven inches in the middle of uh, the box. Uh, with uh, 2.54 or 1 inch uh, distance between each track. Uh, uh, each loop uh, the, from the beginning of the, of the scanning track to the end to, until it reaches the same uh, beginning again, uh, the same, uh, the, the one loop will take about 17.5 seconds. Uh, the scanning loops uh, continue uh, until uh, for the soil and water surface uh, depth is recorded until no or little um, further erosion is observed and the test uh, is stopped. So when we compare the results from the eight uh, tracks uh, or from the eight uh, scanning uh, profile, we noticed that no significant difference along the width um, of the test box, indicating that there is little uh, plume side effect. Uh, these plots uh, that are shown on the slides, they show the soil surface with each loop along profile five. Profile five is approximately in the middle of the, t uh, of the test box. It's the longitudinal profile along the middle of the box, which is, um, and the slide shows soil profiles um, at the first five soil passes uh, with different colors, and then the final, uh, the final profile or the final pass uh, is uh, plotted in the light uh, blue color uh, for, the, um, for those four tests at the, uh, with the, on the four soil mixes. Um, on the left-hand side, the two uh, plots uh, results for uh, mixes four and five. Uh, again, mix four is the clean, uh, uh, gravelly material with no fines. Uh, mix five has 5% five uh, uh, fines with 2% clay. Uh, and they are uh, presented for uh, a test that uh, is 2% slope with 2% CFS or cubic foot per second of the flow rate. Um, the test uh, the soil profiles are comparable, as you can see, with observation of some uh, erroneous data uh, that uh, you can see that they are above the uh, initial surface, um, and that can be attributed to the turbulent flow, uh, as you will see in a, in a video I will show later, uh, as well as so the. Uh, could be uh, attributed to suspended sediments in the flow uh, during the erosion. Uh, the two uh, plots on the right-hand side, those are for uh, mix 6 mod and 6A uh, mod. Again, those two mixes, they have up to 15% of fines and 5% 5 uh, 5 clay. Uh, you can see that there is a significant increase in the number of passes uh, we're required to achieve the same erosion depth. Uh, so uh, if you look at the final uh, pass number, uh, there are 162 and 290 passes uh, compared to 30 or 50 passes for the first two uh, mixes, uh, which puts an emphasis uh, on the role of, of fines or clay content on the erosion process. Um, and also it should be noted that the uh, those two uh, tests or for on six uh, on uh, mixes six uh, were run at a higher uh, bed shear uh, 
uh, with 6% slope and 3 CFS. So even at a higher slope, at a higher uh, slope and higher bit shear, this still eroded in uh, in a slower uh, rate. Uh, the two charts uh, to the left-hand side they show the maximum erosion depth along the middle profile 5 um, as it progresses with time. So we can notice an increase in fluctuation in the value of the maximum erosion uh, that could be a result from the deposition of the eroded particles into the minimum elevation uh, or the minimum point on the soil surface which can move the minimum surface to another location in uh, in the next scan. Uh, so the fluctuation that is basically it just uh, some depositions in the in the minimum uh, point or the minimum location along the soil surface. Um, however, as a general trend, uh, the erosion starts fast, uh, then it slows down with time as the soil surface reaches an equilibrium. In the soil surface kind of levels out. And this behavior is attributed to the change in the hydraulic loading uh, and the acting bed shear changes uh, as the erosion uh, depth increases. Uh, so it, the, the soil surface comes to um, an equilibrium. Uh, in case of the, uh, of the cleaner mixes, uh, four and five on the very, uh, left, uh, on the very left hand side um, uh, chart, uh, the erosion reached approximately 10 centimeter, um, but only 4 centimeters in the case of the uh, mixes with the higher fines, uh, the, the blue and the gray uh, lines uh, on the next, uh, next one, ne second uh, chart from the left. Uh, the two charts on the right-hand side show the rate of erosion uh, for the four mixes. Again, uh, mi the cleaner mixes uh, in the red and the black, and the, uh, the, the mixes with the higher fines content on the very right-hand uh, side, the blue and the gray. Um, so in, in we calculated the erosion rate by dividing the difference between the initial elevation and the minimum soil elevation along the along the profile by the corresponding time. And as you can see or can be uh, noticed that the erosion rate is reduced significantly with time. Uh, in the first uh, 400 seconds, uh, the reduction ranges from four times to one order of magnitude. Um, and this reduction of erosion rate could not be calculated or even uh, noticed if the erosion measurements are not taken at very small time intervals from the beginning of the test, and this capability was facilitated by uh, the use of the uh, of the the new lidar system. Uh, this slide here shows uh, two tables that uh, summarize the test conditions um, and the results for the four mixes uh, at an initial erosion of about one point. B1 to the minus 3 meter per second, mix 5 maintains approximately 1.5 times higher than mix 4. Um, and this could be attributed to the smaller particle size of the, the particle sizes that are larger than the D50 in mix 5, because mix 5 has a maximum size of about uh, half, of, half an inch of 12.5 uh, uh, millimeters compared to mix 4 that is cleaner uh, doesn't have any fines, but yet the maximum particle size is about one inch. So the smaller the, the particle size would, uh, the dislodging uh, of these particle sizes will be faster uh, at the same initial bed shear. Um, and uh, so it, it seems that a slightly higher uh, fines content of 5% and a clay content of 2% compared to zero for mix four didn't have an effect in reducing the erosion rate, uh, at least during the te th these uh, test, uh, test conditions. Um, it's also is noticed that the erosion rate for the two mixes, um, they're kind of following the same uh, initial trend. In the both mixes, uh, the erosion rate is reduced by, by about an order of magnitude after uh, 13 minutes or 800 seconds. 
uh, if we compare these results to the uh, to the two uh, to two other mixes uh, with higher uh, with higher fines content, uh, we can see that the erosion rate uh, is substantially has decreased. Uh, and uh, the, the difference again, the difference between those two uh, mixes is the maximum size. Uh, one of them is the 12.7 millimeters, and the other one is one inch. And the same conclusion uh, for the first two mixes can be drawn: that the smaller the particle size, uh, the faster the particles can be dislodged from uh, the pit shear. However, due to the higher fines content. Uh, both mixes, uh, the about the, the erosion rate is about one half of uh, of the of the cleaner mixes. So we can compare an initial erosion rate of 3.7 to minus four uh, versus 8.5 uh, or 6.8 to minus four compared to 1.3 to minus three meter per second. Um, and these results of the, the finer, the, the higher the fine content, uh, the, uh, the slower the erosion rate is in line uh, with conclusions from uh, previous research studies. Um, this uh, uh, short video here shows the lighter uh, scanning of mix four. Uh, and the initial uh, dislodging of the material uh, at the introduction of the water. Um, it seems that the video is kind of upside down. Uh, I apologize for that, but uh, you probably can uh, see it uh, here. Um, not sure if I'm able to run it again. So you can see the green uh, light for the laser and then the uh, beginning of the test. And then the particles started to uh, erode. And then you have this turbulent flow in the hydraulic jack happening as the uh, erosion is deepening. Uh, for the same testing condition, uh, this is uh, mix five um, with the same acting bed shear and slightly higher uh, fines content, uh, but with a smaller maximum size, uh, you can see that the uh, erosion rate um, is higher and the, the fines and the, the smaller particle size, they move uh, faster. Uh, at the same acting bed shear compared to the previous slide. So as a summary and uh, conclusions uh, for this uh, for these uh, test results that I'm uh, pre presented to you, so the flume tests were uh, performed on gravelly soil mixes with D50 of 5 millimeters, fines between 0 and 15, and clay content uh, between 0 and 5 percent, with a maximum size of half an inch to one inch, and the flow rate uh, is between 0.057, 0.0. .0 Eight five uh, cubic meter per second, or two to three cfs uh, cubic foot per second, and flume slopes between two six percent. Uh, the erosion rate significantly decreases with time, uh, at, and this reduction is uh, calculated if the erosion measurements 
uh, were not taken at small uh, time intervals uh, from the beginning of the test. And I'm talking about the initial, uh, the initial erosion rate uh, where, when the initial bit shear has not changed yet uh, uh, due to the uh, progress, uh, progression in the erosion. Uh, the initial erosion rate and the level of reduction over time is affected by both the fines content and the coarser portion of the soil mix that is uh, larger than the D50. Uh, the fines and clay content increase to 15% and 5% respectively. The erosion rate is reduced by one half compared to mixes with a similar coarser portion but with less fines content. So we're comparing uh, the uh, two mixes, the 6 uh, and 6A, uh, to, uh, to uh, mixes 4 and 5. And for the same clay content uh, and acting initial shear, uh, the larger the coarser portion of the soil mix, the larger the maximum size, uh, and the larger the maximum size, the slower the uh, initial erosion rate. Um, and so I'm talking about the initial erosion rate again because that is uh, corresponding to the initial bed shear, but then we need to run further investigation on these results uh, to quantify the changes in the acting bed shear throughout the test duration as the, shear, as the erosion is progression, progressing. Uh, the shallow water LiDAR offers, offers a new technology that can provide an added research capability in the field of surface erosion and overtopping erosion as it provides measurements in real time uh, under, for water surface as well as soil surface uh, under flowing conditions. It also provides a high precision uh, in longitudinal profiles uh, of the test box up to one centimeter in the horizontal and vertical uh, for the uh, scanned uh, longitudinal profile of about four feet span. Um, this will conclude my presentation, um, and I welcome any comments or questions, and I thank you for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Gada. Uh, so any questions from the audience? Any questions? Uh, oh, it seems like we just got one that came in, Gata, so. Okay, great. A question from Lucinda Conway. Was the homogeneity of the soil inside the, text, inside the test box tested in terms of fines, content, and density? Did you follow that question, Gata? Uh, was the homogeneity of the soil inside the text, the test box tested in terms of the fines content in the density. As I understand the question, whether we made sure that the soil sample within the box is homogeneous or basically it's just compacted in a homogeneous uh, way, and the answer is yes, because uh, these uh, the, uh, the seven inches were compacted in two lifts. Uh, the first lift is four inches, and the second lift is uh, three inches. And, and these uh, soils were, uh, or, or these mixes were uh, prepared. Uh, they, they were engineered. They were uh, mixed in 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 portions, in um, calculated portions, uh, and each uh, portion would be uh, weighed and uh, the water content is the, the water is weighed so everything is, was made to be consistent and homogeneous within the test box i would say the answer is yes yeah. thank you um you got another question i think we have a bit of time uh question from john smith from the u.s army corps of engineers your home okay there appears to be a correlation between particle size and surface turbulence is that true and is it relevant to erosion rates? Well, definitely. The, well, the, the turbulence of the flow is uh, will affect the hydraulic loading. It basically will affect the acting uh, bed shear on um, on the on the erosion process. And uh, whether there is a, a relation or a correlation between the the mix size and the turbulence, uh, that could be the case. But it. it it's also if the maximum size, it's the fines content, uh, it's the 
uh, it's the density of the soil as well as the hydraulic loading as well. If you run 10 CFS versus 1 CFS, then there will be like, of course, the turbulence is, is will be uh, will be different. Uh, but uh, since the this is beyond the scope of, of our study, uh, what we are after in, in and again, the, the LIDAR uh, could give us the capability of capturing this very initial uh, erosion rate when the bed shear has not changed significantly due to the prog to progression in the erosion. However, because we know the erosion surface as, you know, with the test, we can definitely evaluate how is the shear is dissipating, the shear stress is dissipating along the eroded surface, and that's something that we are uh, you know, uh, going to, to study further. Fantastic. Um, great. And uh, there was a question just generally surrounding the, the session today. It was, uh, will you get a copy of the slides of the presentations? And as I heard from ASCE, they'll be recording this presentation and it should be available in their YouTube channel. Uh, so stay tuned, um, but it should be available there. Great. Well, thank you, Gata. That was excellent. Thank you. Great. So on to the third presentation. Bear with me. Uh, yes. Okay, Ben. <clears throat> thank you, Ben. Um, uh, can you hear me all right? Uh, good morning, ladies just and fine. Gentlemen. Okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this uh, case study I'm presenting uh, today uh, deals with uh, remediation of a large uh, landslide complex at the uh, Frank R. Bowerman landfill. Uh, it's one of the largest uh, municipal solid waste landfills uh, in in California, and it is a canyon landfill, which means that uh, you take advantage. Uh, of the existing topography and develop uh, these large canyons into large uh, waste containment cells. Uh, this is an aerial photograph of a portion of the site. Uh, the southern part of the site is the currently operating landfill. The northern portion of the site is uh, slated for development over the next uh, couple of decades. Uh, however, uh, expansion in that area is uh, severely constrained uh, by a complex of uh, landslides uh, with a footprint of approximately 80 acres. And these landslides have to be remediated uh, to make uh, future expansions uh, possible in this area. Uh, because of the large uh, size of the, um, uh, the large footprint of these landslide complex, the remediation had to be done in stages. Uh, stages one and two are complete. I'll talk very briefly about them. And uh, the subject of this presentation is going to be the design of the third and uh, final uh, stage of the remediation. <clears throat> uh, this is a um, close-up of the uh, landslide. Uh, the landslide complex is uh, dominated by two large landslides and multiple smaller landslides, both ancient and recent. And um, the largest of the landslides is an active uh, landslide. That's the, that's the landslide in the center, um, outlined in yellow or shaded in yellow. And that's an active landslide. It has a footprint of approximately 40 acres. Um, and for the purpose of this presentation, I'll call that the active landslide. On the east flank of this landslide is a incipient landslide, meaning it's a, a potentially active landslide. It could be contiguous with the active landslide. It has a similar footprint, another approximately 40 acres, um, and it could be contiguous and could potentially move with the active landslide. Uh, to give you an idea of scale, the elevation relief we are talking about at the top of the ridge, elevation is about 1,700 feet. Two of the active landslides, about 900 feet. So we have about an 800 foot uh, uh, elevation change. So the remediation that had been taking place up to now, um, uh, the first stage of the remediation was completed in 2009. That consisted of unloading the head scarp. This is the part on the left, head scarp of the active landslide. Uh, 
took out approximately five, five and a half million cubic yards of landslide debris and bedrock uh, to make the uh, um, landslide a little bit more stable. Um, the second stage consists of partial remediation of the uh, incipient landslide on the east, uh, and that involved taking out approximately seven and a half million cubic yards of material. Uh, in spite of these two stages, the active landslide is still active, uh, and that is the part of the presentation that we have be talking about here. Uh, by the way, these landslides occur in uh, sedimentary uh, rock. <clears throat> so the stages one and two combined it had approximately 12.7 million cubic yards of earthwork, uh, including some stabilization of smaller landslides. This was done through two large uh, earth moving contracts, totaling approximately $40 million. Uh, right now, we ended up with about uh, cut slopes up to 600 feet in height. Uh, along with the unloading of the head scars, there were a network of horizontal drains that were installed. Um, this shows uh, the cluster of horizontal drains that have been installed. We had over 100 of them, um, each one of them anywhere from 600 to 800 feet in length. Um, and, uh, the, and the purpose of this, of course, was to relieve the pore water pressure and lower the groundwater table. The groundwater, of course, is contained in uh, discontinues in the rock. So some of the uh, horizontal drains made a lot of water. Some did not. Uh, but particularly on the east flank, where we have the incipient landslide, it was pretty effective. We were able to lower the groundwater table anywhere from uh, 50 to 70 feet in some places and we had over 170 gallons per minute of uh, flow uh, at the time it was installed. This groundwater is collected uh, in, in basins on the site and used for dust control purposes. Uh, the head scarp uh, removal, of course, did not go without incident. Uh, during the uh, stage two remediation, we uh, had a la large unanticipated uh, landslide that took place uh, covered a footprint of about eight acres, 120 foot high slope. Um, it's a nice story for another day. I won't be going into, uh, into the details of that, uh, but do want to point out uh, the person that you see on the lower slide in the middle of the head scarf, that's uh, Tim Stark, uh, breaking all kinds of safety rules to be inside the, the head scarf. Somebody had to take the photograph, so I stood at the safe spot on top and took the uh, picture. But anyway, moving on. Um, so the, uh, the presentation, I want to talk about a few things. One is I want to talk about the, uh, the refined uh, geologic model of the active and incipient landslide. I want to talk a little bit about how we develop the shear strength parameters, um, then talk uh, about the stabilization scheme, and finally address some potential uh, construction issues. <clears throat> So over the, um, over the years, we have a number of uh, uh, field investigation uh, locations. We have a network of over 80 coholes, borings, uh, inclinometers, piezometers. Uh, several of them have downhole geophysics. And then we also have a network of surface monuments. The active landslide, as you might imagine, was uh, relatively easy to characterize in terms of geometry uh, because it, it moves. So uh, typically you would install an inclinometer and within a couple of weeks it would be sheared off, uh, having done its job of defining the geometry of the uh, slide surface. So the base of the slide surface is very well defined. Uh, these contours that you see on the right represent the base of the uh, slide surface. The active landslide itself is about 2,000 feet long, 1,000 feet wide. Uh, the basal rupture surface is uh, about up to 230 feet deep. Uh, the elevation relief is about 360 feet from the top to the toe. Um, and there is a perched uh, groundwater table above uh, the landslide surface, and that uh, uh, is, is significant when it comes to remediation. The incipient landslide, which uh, occurs to the, uh, uh, to the uh, east or to the right of the active landslide, uh, the question marks uh, indicate that it is not as well defined for obvious reasons. It hasn't moved significantly yet. Uh, the landslide, uh, uh, from what we can estimate, straddles the multiple formations. It was on the verge of failure uh, prior to our stage two uh, remedial grading. Uh, 
and once the remedial grading was complete, of course, uh, and there was no further deformation, so we could not uh, uh, identify the limits of the landslide any more clearly. But uh, all appearances are that it is contiguous with the active landslide, and that presents a significant stability problem to deal with. Uh, the groundwater uh, conditions, there is a regional groundwater table that's actually well below the active landslide uh, rupture surface. Uh, however, there is also a significant perched uh, groundwater table within the active landslide mass. It's anywhere from 20 feet to about 100 feet above the basal uh, rupture surface of the landslide. <clears throat> So to, uh, uh, to illustrate the kind of the geologic model that we created of the, of the two landslides, um, best illustrated to, uh, through two cross-sections. The first cross-section is a north-south cross-section uh, parallel to the main axis of movement of the active landslide. Uh, you can see the original grade. Uh, you see the relatively flat uh, surface of the rupture surface is the cross-section on top. Um, and uh, as you can see, there are multiple uh, landslides. Uh, uh, it's a series of uh, progressive landslides or retrogressive landslides that occurred over time. The first, very first landslide was a uh, rotational failure at the toe, and then over time it uh, migrated upwards. Uh, so what you have is uh, are multiple landslides within this large landslide mass. The fill that you see on the left that was a fill that was placed to allow uh, waste placement, waste fill placement to the to the left, and that uh, although it was not designed as a buttress, does uh, serve as a limited buttress. Uh, has certainly not uh, was not certainly not sufficient to completely stop movement of the landslide, but uh, does help. The second cross section, which is uh, uh, northeast to southwest, uh, it's kind of oblique to the direction of landslide movement, and that uh, illustrates how the uh, incipient landslide and active landslides uh, interact. The yellow mass that you see is the active landslide. Uh, the uh, estimated geometry of the incipient landslides are shown, and as you can see, uh, the, the two landslides together form a very uh, likely contiguous uh, mechanism of failure uh, that we had to uh, look at. <clears throat> uh, the landslide uh, is uh, very active. Currently, it uh, moves at anywhere from 0.1 to 0.2 inches per day. Uh, when we completed the stage one and two remediation, uh, there was a significant slowdown in the level of movement, but since then there was some activity at the toe area, and uh, since then the uh, movement has accelerated. So now, over the last two years, we've had the northern block of the active landslide has moved anywhere from 15 to 17 feet, the central block 8 to 15 feet. The southern block has been constrained by that field I was talking to you about, so it's a lot less order of a uh, couple of feet. And uh, because of the movement, there's a distinct uh, scar pattern, basically, which outlines, the, that's the outline shown in red, that outlines the, uh, the shape of the active landslide. So what we learn from all these movement uh, vectors, both from inclinometers as well as surface monuments, is that the landslide is not a monolithic uh, moving mass. It, is move, it has multiple blocks. Each block moves in a slightly different direction at slightly different uh, rates of movement. Uh, but all of them slide along a single uh, basal uh, shear rupture surface, uh, but there are multiple head scarps and multiple toes, and all of these smaller landslides basically ride uh, within, the larger, uh, within the larger landslide. So it makes it a lot more difficult to model. Uh, I want to uh, shift the focus to uh, the landslide uh, shear planes. This is some photographs of uh, landslide uh, planes that were uh, exposed during various failures at the site. As you can see, it's a very distinct uh, slick and sided surface. Uh, the surfaces are very thin, could easily be missed in core samples. And um, the landslides uh, on site, they span uh, 
several different geologic formations, uh, six different formations actually, and then we have multiple types of uh, weak planes ranging from active landslide planes to potential landslide planes, uh, lichen sides, uh, clay seams, uh, um, we have uh, joints, uh, faults, all kinds of uh, different weak planes. So we had to come up with a uh, effective and efficient way of characterizing each one of these different weak planes for slope stability analysis. The, and the approach that we took was to um, uh, <clears throat> was to uh, first uh, select uh, select a limited number of samples and uh, uh, do um, torsional ring shear tests on them for residual shear strength determination on a selected number of samples that are representative of the range of materials on site, and use these results to establish a site-specific validation of the correlations established by Stark in 2005 and Stark and Hussein in 2013. Um, and these correlations, what they relate residual shear strength to the liquid limit and clay content of the, of, of the, of the clay materials. Uh, so once we established this uh, site-specific validation, then we were able to go back to each one of these uh, weak planes, get multiple samples of the weak plane, uh, estimate shear strength uh, based on a large number of uh, bulk samples, and uh, from uh, the estimate, estimated uh, uh, shear strength parameters, we could uh, end up getting uh, ranges and average values of shear strength for each one of the uh, parameters. I'm sorry, for each one of the weak planes. Uh, in the case of landslide failure planes, we, step, uh, we went one step further, and uh, we did some uh, back analysis of the landslides to refine the shear strength values. <clears throat> so this uh, shows the uh, site-specific validation of the correlations. Uh, we uh, selected 17 uh, samples, performed torsional ring shear tests on them, the plot on the left shows the predicted versus measured values of residual shear strength. Uh, the stark correlations give you uh, predicted uh, second friction angles at three different uh, normal stresses, low, medium, and high. Uh, in this plot, we are comparing the um, uh, residual fr uh, fr uh, friction angles at uh, uh, the medium and high values of normal stress which are representative of the actual field conditions because our landslide planes are very deep. Uh, so as you can see, uh, you get fairly good correspondence, uh, particularly at the higher confining stresses. Uh, those are the green triangles that you see on the plot on the left. And uh, the plot on the right uh, is essentially the same data. We are plotting the, uh, or we are comparing the uh, uh, predicted versus measured values of residual shear strength and plotting it against the liquid limit. And as you can see, this valid, it is valid except for a couple of outliers. In general, the correlation is pretty good. And uh, what this shows is that for liquid limits ranging from about 20 to about 140, uh, wide range of materials, the validation uh, is, is good for the site and uh, the corresponding residual friction angles range anywhere from 4 degrees to 30 degrees. So once this site-specific validation was established, we could go to the next step of uh, uh, taking samples from individual weak planes. So this uh, illustrates what we did for the uh, active and incipient landslide planes. We took a total of 34 samples, tested each one of them for liquid limit and uh, clay content, and using the correlations uh, we estimated uh, the shear strength envelope. The envelope is a nonlinear envelope it's developed based on the second friction angles at low, medium, and high uh, normal stresses and forcing the failure plane to go through uh, the origin, basically assuming zero cohesion. You end up with a nonlinear strength envelope. So we ended up with 34 envelopes, and this shows the, uh, the mean and the mean uh, plus and we mean minus one standard deviation uh, of the uh, residual <coughs> shear strength uh, envelopes. Um, the next step for the uh, back analysis, um, for the uh, active landslide, we assume that the entire landfill fails as one block. We are basically ignoring the progressive nature of the failure, and what this does is it provides an average strength envelope. Um, it's a uh, uh, 
uh, is something that can be used for design of the remedy. Um, and uh, we used uh, multiple uh, cross-sections, uh, assumed a factor of safety anywhere from 0.9 uh, to 1, uh, and came up with the average uh, uh, estimate uh, or back analyzed estimate of the shear, average shear strength of the entire uh, rupture plane. In the case of the incipient landslide, we looked at a mechanism where the incipient landslide fails in conjunction uh, with the active landslide on the left. This is the, uh, the cross section that's shown at the bottom. Um, however, the uh, landslide, in spite of the fact that the active landslide is moved by several tens of feet uh, and separated from the incipient landslide, the incipient landslide is still stable, which means the factor of safety is greater than one. Uh, however, in, in modeling this, we assumed because of the separation that there's no shear resistance along the rupture surface of the active landslide. So there was only a gravity load uh, over the active landslide along the incipient landslide plane. Um, of course, there was resistance, and we uh, did the back analysis. Uh, the next slide shows the results of the back analysis um, uh, for the active landslide. The back-analyzed envelope falls between the mean and mean minus one standard deviation. Uh, this is a nonlinear envelope. If you look at the equal and linear uh, parameters, it's roughly equivalent to a cohesion of 200 friction angle of about seven degrees. If you look at the incipient landslide, it falls slightly above the mean plus one standard deviation uh, residual strength envelope. However, it's well below the fully softened strength, and the equal and linear parameters are cohesion of 200 friction angle of 14.5 degrees. So the shear strength parameters, in summary, we already talked about the uh, weak planes. In the case of intact bedrock, we treated it as an anisotropic material with one or more weak plane orientations. The weak plane orientations are determined based on downhole geophysics um, and uh, based on the uh, uh, downhole geophysics, we established the uh, directions or orientations of uh, predominant fracture trends. And uh, along those uh, orientations, uh, we had the um, weak plane strength, and elsewhere we used the intact uh, strength. The uh, design criteria, these are all interim slopes, uh, meaning uh, at some point in the future, they are going to be stabilized by placement of refuse fill. Uh, however, they are going to be remain. Uh, they are going to remain exposed for several years. In some cases, maybe even de even decades. But uh, the, the factor of safety we are designing it to is 1.3 for temporary construction slopes. The factor of safety we are using is 1.1. And the objective of the uh, stabilization uh, approach was uh, one was to lock the active landslide in place. It's currently moving, so factor of safety is less than one. Our goal was to increase the factor of safety to 1.3. Uh, we had to, however, do this uh, without triggering any movement on the incipient landslide, um, which is a very uh, likely scenario. You mess with the active landslide, uh, you could end up uh, destabilizing the incipient landslide. So we had to design it to make sure that the incipient landslide had a factor of safety of 1.3 as well. Uh, a single approach uh, or a single measure could not achieve these goals, so we had to resort to a combination of measures, um, and that's illustrated uh, on these uh, cross sections. So the uh, figure on the left shows, uh, so the first measure that we took was uh, further unloading of the headscarp area of the active landslide, which is outlined in yellow here. Uh, however, the removals had to be limited because the more you remove, uh, this is illustrated on the cross-section on the right that shows the removals in the head scarp area. The more you remove, higher the potential for triggering a failure with the incipient landslide. So we had to design the uh, depth of removals uh, to make sure uh, that there was no uh, failure taking place in the incipient landslide. Uh, luckily, the uh, geology of the uh, incipient landslide as well as the geometry suggested a three-dimensional slope stability analysis was appropriate, so we did a three-dimensional slope stability analysis uh, and designed the excavation to come up with a factor of safety of 1.3. The second measure was to 
uh, stabilize the toe area, the southern area of the landslide, uh, and that was accomplished by, or that will be accomplished by uh, 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 accelerating the placement of waste at the toe. So that will uh, uh, create a certain uh, buttressing effect at the toe. And the third and final measure was to go in and construct a buttress along the southwest flank of the landslide. And these three measures in combination uh, would uh, stabilize the active landslide. There are, however, several challenges to uh, construction of the buttress particularly. The buttress keyway dimensions, on, uh, by the way, uh, 900 feet long, 150 feet wide, up to 150 feet deep. It has to be excavated within an active landslide. Uh, there is a perch groundwater to deal with, and uh, because of these reasons, landslide during construction are highly likely. So the measures that we took, uh, one was to kind of locate the buttress keyway oblique to the landslide movement. That helps with stability a little bit. The groundwater, of course, had to be lowered. will have to be lowered with uh, deep wells. Uh, the grades around the edges of the excavation will be lowered temporarily so that the height of slopes uh, uh, are lowered. And then, um, uh, most importantly, the buttress excavation would have to be done in slots. It's a progressive slot cut excavation uh, so that the exposed uh, slide plane at any one time is no wider than 100 feet at any one time. So this basically limits the size of potential failures. And then finally, we had to anticipate and plan for landslides uh, during construction. It's very likely that they that we would end up with small landslides during construction. So the slot con uh, construction design took advantage of three-dimensional effects. It increases the factor of safety as well as reduces the size of potential failures. So by limiting the size of the uh, slot to about 100 feet, we are able to um, um, limit the likely size of failures. Uh, the construction of slot cut construction is uh, is um, fairly um, fairly common in this kind of terrain. The way you do it after you uh, cut your initial slot, then you excavate from uh, one flank and use the material that you excavate to fill the other flank. So what happens is you end up with a uh, slot that continuously moves. So you get a progressively moving slot from one end of the buttress to the other. The two photographs at the bottom show a similar slot cut construction at the same site for a different landslide. Uh, the scrapers that you see on the left are excavating the slot uh, on the uh, left flank, and uh, these scrapers take the materials to the fill that is being constructed. That's shown on the, on the, on the right. That's the uh, uh, fill being constructed on the right flank of the excavation, and this uh, slot gradually moves from one side to the other. <clears throat> that uh, basically concludes uh, the uh, details of the, of the, uh, uh, of the design. I uh, would like to conclude by making a couple of remarks. One is on the high cost of landslide mitigation. Uh, as I mentioned, we had already spent, or the, uh, or the county had already spent about uh, 30, 40 million dollars on stages one and two, stage three may cost another $15 million, uh, and uh, is the, is, are these costs warranted? Uh, after all, it's just a canyon, it's going to get filled with uh, waste eventually, but uh, the reason it's warranted is uh, um, uh, because of scarcity of permitted landfill space, uh, particularly in a adjacent to urban areas. This is a landfill located in an urban area. It's impossible to permit a landfill like this uh, these days, so you need to maximize the available airspace within a limited footprint. This landfill has a uh, design life left of about 30 years, so it's very important that uh, we get ma maximum use out of it. And uh, secondly, you get uh, large dividends. This is a huge uh, revenue source uh, uh, for the county, uh, and the cost of remediation is uh, more than made up for in terms of uh, uh, the revenues that are generated. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about uh, some of the contracting strategies to address ground, mo uh, ground movement during construction. Like I mentioned, it's very likely to happen, almost certain to happen. So you have to have very tight bid documents to take care of the possibility. Uh, 
One is to specify a minimum experience requirements for the contractor. We basically say the contractor needs to have experience working in active landslide terrain, working with the active landslide during construction, and that's going to be a very important part of the of a smooth construction uh, project. Uh, secondly, you will require the contractor to submit a contingency work plan in the event landslide occur during construction. And third, very important, that you include an adequate uh, TNM allowance, time and material allowance in your budget, in the construction budget, to allow for landslide uh, during construction. So you put in a couple of million dollars maybe to address any kind of uh, uh, landslides that could occur during construction. And then finally, it's very important to have uh, real-time ground movement monitoring with a network of inclinometers and surface monuments, and you need engineering support uh, during construction, so uh, you can design remedies in real time and implement them uh, during construction. Um, that concludes my presentation. If there are any questions, be happy to answer them. Uh, that was great, Suji. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, you did get one question during your presentation. Uh, how did you determine the base of the active landslide? Now, I'm guessing this is inclinometers and borings and the likes of that. If you could uh, just elaborate. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, so the uh, base cell rupture surface was uh, essentially established based on uh, inclinometers. We had uh, core holes as well, uh, but because of the very thin uh, nature of the um, of the slide plane. It's almost impossible to pick the slide plane uh, on uh, with core samples. Uh, one is that they are very thin. Second, there are multiple shear surfaces, slick and side, so you don't know which one is actually the active landslide surface. On the other hand, inclinometers are very effective. You put them in, and um, they basically shear off where the landslide is, and uh, it doesn't take very long because the landslide was so active, uh, it would shear off in a couple of weeks and be able to uh, get a very good idea of what the landslide geometry or basal geometry looked like. Uh, that's great. Um, we haven't received any other questions, but I actually have a question for you. Um, very cool project. So did, did you have any issues with uh, horizontal drains considering that the mass was deforming, or did they just function uh, pretty well throughout? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> horizontal drains, um, uh, yeah, definitely those uh, are subject to the same issues as inclinometers. They do get uh, um, sheared if they happen to um, cross or uh, cut across a slight plane, then they become ineffective relatively quickly. Um, these are basically one and a half inch uh, diameter uh, horizontal drains, and they are very long and very difficult to control the, the orientation as well as the elevations as you drill. So as you drill, if you hit a uh, hard uh, um, uh, rock or into a hard interval or a cemented interval, that kind of deviates the orientation of your of your uh, drilling and you end up with uh, horizontal drains going in all kinds of different directions. So there is a high rate of failures with these horizontal drains, but overall they do a, a very effective job. Uh, like I said, they did lower the groundwater table significantly uh, in the areas that mattered. We had the groundwater being lowered by you know 50, in some cases even 70 feet, and that uh, that was. Uh, that are significant in terms of uh, uh, stability, uh, effects on stability. Yeah, that's quite a lowering of groundwater. Um, pretty impressive. Uh, thanks thanks for answering that question. I, I appreciate it. And great presentation. Thanks. So uh, I don't see any other. Oh, one more question. Uh, oh, great question, too. Was there any concern during horizontal drain installation that the process of installation would destabilize the slope? Uh, for example, the drains are long, you might need pressure to install the wells, and was that considered during uh, stability analysis during installation? Yeah, yeah good, good question. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, we 
well, basically the, the orientation of the uh, horizontal drains are kind of perpendicular to the direction of movement, so we are not uh, kind of uh, lubricating the uh, the failure plane are we, we since we are doing going perpendicular to the to the failure planes uh, the, we minimize the risk and in terms of overall size we are talking uh, a couple of thousand feet uh, long by a thousand foot wide uh, landslide surface uh, and these uh, horizontal drains even though we have a large number of them uh, are each uh, uh, one and a half to two inches in diameter so uh, they are pretty small in terms of uh, physical impact on the large uh, size of the slide plane itself. Um, uh, so we didn't think it was uh, significant uh, enough to warrant looking at it in terms of the uh, effect it has on, on, on stability, but that, that, that is uh, a, a good concern to have. Great, great. Well, thank you. Um, really enjoyed that, and we'll uh, we'll move on to the last presentation of today, and that is me, Ben Lashinsky, uh, Oregon State, and uh, I'll be looking at a uh, I'll follow I'll be following up on these great presentations with kind of a different scale of analysis, more kind of preliminary, regional scale kinds of studies. So will it stay or will it go? Use of lidar as a tool to do planning around landslides. So I don't need to go into depth at this point after these previous presentations to say that landslides cause a pretty big problem all over the U.S. and all over the world for that matter. Um, prior to projects, one of the starting points is using spatial techniques, maps, the likes of that, to understand what kind of hazards might exist in a certain area. One of the first steps in doing this is, is something that's been booming in recent years is creating landslide inventories which is essentially maps of landslide deposits, mechanisms, and other sorts of metadata um, to basically guide how we might think about a project as a starting point. LIDAR has been exceptionally useful for looking uh, at mapping landslides. So why is LIDAR useful for mapping landslide deposits? Here you see uh, a typical satellite image. This happens to be the West Hills of Portland and, uh, you know, Oregon's quite green. There's quite a bit of forest here. There's also quite a bit of development. And it's not so easy to spot the landslides. However, LIDAR enables us to create what's called a bare earth digital elevation model, which is basically a representation of the ground surface collected by the instrument. It allows us to process off that vegetation or, or other artifacts, we might call it, and get some representation of what the actual ground surface looks like. So in this example, all of the vegetation has been removed. You can still see artifacts of development, but the landslides, for example, the head scarps or, or hummocky terrain represented the deposits are quite apparent. And this is, all, this is now what quite a few geological surveys and, and planners are using to inventory and map landslide deposits. So a brief intro. Um, if I can just go to the next slide. A brief intro about what is LIDAR. Uh, many of you are likely familiar with LIDAR at this point, either as a user or you've heard of it, um, or you're very familiar with it. But just in case, LIDAR is an acronym. We love acronyms. And it stands for Light Detection and Ranging Technology. And it, it's essentially a laser. So this laser with uh, a known or estimated speed of light is uh, shot. And we can measure the time it takes for a photon to leave the laser and return. And knowing its orientation and taking many laser measurements quickly over time, we can start to get three-dimensional coordinates of, say, the ground surface or the vegetation above it. It's taken a variety of ways. Gata showed a very interesting way for using it for, for measurements, for experimentation. But outside, we use it satellite, airborne, submarine, and terrestrial. So when we have this signature, this DM or point cloud, really, what we can do is we can process that point cloud to get the differing signature of the canopy versus the bare earth beneath it. And that bare earth is what we really care about when we look at landslide hazards. Very useful for inventorying landslides. So what we've been working on is 
trying to expedite the process or do some preliminary, create some preliminary tools that semi-automate the process of landslide inventory. Landslide inventory is critically important. However, it is a very uh, time-consuming process. It's understandably subjective. It requires expertise. Um, but we would just, we've been working with our local geological survey to help speed up the process. So the typical way that it's done manually by experts is trained geologists or mappers will interpret uh, LIDAR or other types of DEMs or orthophotos as they used to, to look at what features might be associated uh, with a landslide. Head scarps, hummocky terrain, debris flow fans. And it's probably the most effective way, besides boots on the ground, to actually figure out what landslides have occurred and what kind of risks or hazards you might expect in a certain area. The problem is it takes a while. And I have to imagine, as we can, many of us can relate to, if you look at a computer screen all day, your eyes start to hurt. So, you know, it's different. It's, it's a difficult job. And it's different by mapper. There's a variety of semi-automated or even automated approaches at this point to aid in the process of mapping, and it tries to replicate some of what we, uh, we would do as an expert, a geologist, a geotechnical engineer, a mapper, and usually pretty accurate and much more time efficient. So what we've done is tried to replicate basically what the mappers uh, in the Oregon Geological Survey, Dogami, do which is basically look for certain landforms or features that are associated with, with uh, various landslides. The first step of the procedure we've developed is basically to look for, for landforms that look like head scarves. Uh, usually what we'll do is we'll take a digital elevation model from LIDAR and we will try to get rid of noise through a variety of techniques. And then what we do is we look for kind of the, the topography associated with head scarves. So often steeper slope, often planned form curvature that's concave up, and uh, profile curvature that's concave up. And what we do is we do a raster-based analysis to extract some of these features and turn them into polygons or lines that we can use in the next stage of mapping. We can map head scarves. From there, we use a tool. We call it SICKM. I'm not very good at coming up with acronyms, but that, that's what we got. What we do is we use these head scarp lines to basically look downslope and assign uh, nodes and intervals and discretize the downslope of this, this head scarp and cascade connections down until they reach a certain gradient that's considered gentle where we cut off uh, kind of the cascading of these connections. And what we get, as you can see in the blue here, is some outline of a shape that represents a landslide. From there, we can use the bounds to assign uh, a polygon that we would say is a deposit. Now, this tool by no means can replace a geologist or an expert, but it's intended to kind of draw your attention to areas uh, of, of concern. It's meant to start as preliminary planning, and that's uh, what it's being used for. It also allows us to kind of look at quantitative observations with, with less effort. So here is a, a 150 square kilometer uh, area west of Corvallis, Oregon, and pretty unstable terrain, tie formation. Um, what we see is we've mapped a couple hundred landslides here, and we can notice some trends geologically. The rose plots show basically the number of landslides and the volumes and their general direction of failure, the aspect of failure. We can see that there's a, a tendency to go to the north or northwest and this is what's been observed throughout this part of the Oregon Coast Range, is that there's adverse dipping planes that dip to the north and northwest, and we often see very large failures, earth flows or progressive failures, following that direction. We can compare slope in blue. We see the slope of all cells within this watershed. In red, we see the slope, the histogram, and the distribution of the landslide deposits, and, and they don't match up. You know, physics, of course, tells us that gravity is, is a pretty bad thing for slope stability, but of course, since these signatures are different, it basically tells us, of course, there's some geologic structure that's governing here. 
And often what we see is that the residual shear strengths of, of uh, these geologic units tend to be between 15 to 20 degrees, and they tend to move in that, at that inclination. And we can see that there's an approximate peak around there. We can use inventories for, for lots of things. You know, one of the most common questions I get is, we have a landslide inventory. It's very cool. It's, it looks interesting. How do I use it? So one thing we've been playing around with is just kind of very general, simple forensics. Nothing nearly as, as, as advanced or uh, uh, um, accurate as what's been presented here today but kind of regional scale estimates giving us, give us an idea of what we're kind of dealing with. And basically, the starting point for, for this type of analysis is first getting an estimate of shear surfaces, which, as we all know, is a pretty daunting task. Often you're drilling, often you are installing inclinometers and other sorts of monitoring, and you are trying to get an idea of where that shear point is. Other people have used some other interesting approaches, which includes repeat collection of remote sensing data to kind of get velocities. And what they can do is invert, based on, on viscosity, really, how they might estimate the, the shear depth to look like. And you can see that right here. And then there's classical geomorphic relationships where they relate landslide area to volume fo uh, following the power law based on large sets of landslide inventories that are primarily evacuative, long run out landslides where the shear surface is daylighted afterwards. So what we looked at is not so much the evacuative slides. Those are reasonably estimated through just two series of digital elevation models and differencing. What we look at more is some of the pr more progressive failures, so earth flows and some of the, the slow movers that we have all throughout Oregon, as well as some of the more catastrophic or maybe uh, catastrophic isn't exactly the right word, but some of the failures that have moved uh, considerably that are deep-seated failures, where some of the deposits still lie within the actual uh, shear surface on top of it. The approach we developed is first we basically use this inventory and the shapes associated with it, and we look at the actual shape of the, the head scarp and use that to essentially guide shape fitting. So. Uh, some of the classical relationships for estimating landslide volumes or, or rupture surfaces assume an ellipsoid. This isn't so different than that. What we do is we take the flanks and we fit a surface using Fourier series. And from there, we kind of draw an outline of what the original extents might have been in an idealized world. Now, if you look over here in C, in figure C, that's the shape that we clip to for some of these, these more catastrophic, well-constrained failures. What we do is we notice that there's basically a hole here. We need to put the soil back where it came from. So we use basically, we fill in the hole using the surrounding surface topography to get an idea, a first order estimate of initial conditions. For those landslides that, that don't adhere to uh, uh, these geometric conventions, typically we, uh, we, we classify those as progressive failures. Earth flows are often quite uh, amorphous and their shape is not as easily defined as some of these deep-seated rotational failures we see. Now, what we do to invert uh, an estimated rupture surface, a first-order estimate, is we basically use that, that geometry and the head scarf. Not so different than what you do for a 2D cross-section of a landslide, where you might project the head scarf and, and the, the, the toe and try to get an estimate of a rupture surface. What we do is we do that but we do it in 3D. And we use a technique called a thin plate spline. So a thin plate spline has been used for lots of different kind of mapping and geospatial purposes. And what it really, the reason it's called a thin plate spline is basically it's analogous to having a thin piece of metal where you assign constraints to the edge. Maybe you're bending it somehow. And by having these constraints and using basically this, this type of algorithm, you're capable of producing pretty complex shapes. And in some cases, capturing the asymmetry that is often very relevant to many of these failures we see, most, most slope failures for that matter. So we, we do this, you can see right here in the, the second figure, those red vertical lines represent borings, there's a, there's a red dashed line that represents 
the monitored or measured or approximated failure surface, and the black line is RFIT. We perform this on a series of landslides. You can see that we have four landslides here just shown for simplicity, and the dashed line is our estimate. The black line is what is reported in the, the geotech geotechnical subsurface analyses. And using this, we're able to define parameters that constrain the outer part of the, the landslides for our volume and forensic analyses. What we see is we can get area to volume relationships. So you can see here there's a scatter plot, log log scale, because of course the larger the area, the larger the volume, and, and it follows a power law. And we see that our volumes from almost a thousand landslides in inventory follow pretty well to this power law. There are outliers, many of which exist uh, in, in coastal settings where there's been pretty significant erosion and undercutting from uh, a pretty angry Pacific Ocean. Um, but we get different relationships for progressive failures, which tend to be much larger, and I'll show that again in a second, as opposed to the catastrophic or more constrained failures. And I'll hurry along to, to keep us on time. So with regards to volume, and pardon the busy slide, but if you can just look in the middle vertical column, column B, the top, uh, at the top row in the middle, B1, represents the volume of all landslides from our three landslide inventories, almost 1,000 landslides, and basically the distribution of volumes based on our approach through, uh, for each of these geologic settings, which are different. What we see is that one of the sites, Elk City in red, has by far the largest volume landslides, while Port Orford and Ophir, which are both on the Oregon coast, have smaller volumes of landslides. And this is basically reflected basic, uh, from the progressive failures that we see. There's, there tends to be quite a few earth flows and large progressive failures right there in the tide formation. And while there definitely are some of those on the Oregon coast, they're less noted here. We notice that for B3, which is catastrophic failures, the bands that represent the, the distribution of volumes are much more narrow, and they're shifted to the left. And this is implicative of landslides that are much smaller. So what we see is that a lot of the, a lot of the progressive failures, the earth flows, tend to be quite large in volume, as you might expect. Well, a lot of the deep sea rotational failures, are, they're still big, but they tend to be, follow a more narrow range in volume, and they tend to be smaller in the earth flow terrain. We use this as well to just get first order estimates of, say, shear strength. We don't go into depth about, say, uh, fully softened conditions or, or running ring shear tests or anything like that. It's just meant to be first order planning preliminary analysis work that might guide what you do. So what we do is since we have uh, a landslide geometry in 3D, we can use a method of columns approach to back analyze whole landslide inventories and get estimates of shear strength. Now there's lots of uncertainties associated with this, of course. Basically, we don't always have a great idea of subsurface geologic conditions, uh, slick and sides, as, as uh, Suji uh, uh, mentioned before, or, or hard pan, or the likes of that, but it, start, it still gives us a, a reasonable representation of terrain at a large scale. Not necessarily values you might use in design, but a starting point to understand regional trends in shear strength. So we, uh, since we're using a 3D approach, and many of these failures are asymmetric, what we do is we're able to um, account for asymmetry by adjusting the direction of sliding for each landslide that we look at. So we did some verification against some benchmark solutions using uh, uh, 3D slope stability, and we tend to see about 2-3% difference in our results, which made us feel pretty good. And we've compared that to some of the, uh, the shear strengths determined from uh, some of these landslides that we've seen um, that we've compared to. We see that they're all within a pretty reasonable range. Since we don't know a lot about probably the biggest uncertainty, which is hydrologic conditions, we first bracket between dry and saturated conditions. And we tend to see that our back analyzed shear strengths fall within a very reasonable approximation of what's been measured using ring shear or residual shear testing 
from all of these existing landslides in Oregon. <clears throat> With that, we can start to assign, say, friction angles, or just estimated residual friction angles, to the landslides that, we've, that we have in this inventory here. So these back analyzed uh, shear strengths tend to be oppositely distributed from volume. So what that means is, if you have a bigger volume, and volume is shown in blue here, dark blue being uh, large volume, light blue being small volume. If you have a bigger volume, there's a tendency to have a lower shear strength. If you have a smaller volume, there's a tendency to have a higher shear strength. So basically, since we, if we can recall, much of the very large landslides tend to be earth flows, often comprised of, of high plasticity clay, often in a, a residual state, and often having shear strengths that are in the order of 5, 10, 15 degrees. And we see this kind of inverse relationship when we look at these maps of shear strength distributed throughout. We can look at results versus landslide type. So we have progressive failures, often earth flows or complexes. And we can look at a histogram of shear strength. What we see in the white for the top plot is basically the, the friction angle distribution uh, for the entire inventory for progressive failures. The mean is about 21 degrees, and it's pretty well constrained within there. We just choose an arbitrary threshold for friction angle. We say, you know, if you exceed a friction angle, there, there's likely some level of cementation. We can also then uniquely back out cohesion, which is often uh, a big assumption, but we can still look at this here. So we can see that most of the progressive failures, earth flow terrain, falls within this frictional regime with a frictional strength of about 21 degrees, but even going down to 5, 10 degrees friction. Catastrophic failures, kind of the smaller failures you've observed, tends to be, have a wider range of values. The, the mean friction angle is significantly higher, 24 degrees, uh, and there tends to be a regime where likely there had to be cementation or there's very high friction angles. So we can see that there's a notable difference in shape when we compare these two uh, types of failure mechanisms for these entire landslide inventories. And probably what I think is the most interesting is that to some level we're able to discern just through first order estimates pretty significant differences between each geologic formation. So in those three areas that we looked at and the landslide inventories associated with it, uh, there are five geologic formations. Colebrook Schist, Elk Subterrain, Outer Point Formation, terrace deposits on the coast, and the Taiyi, which is just west of where I live. So we can see that there's distinctly different histograms and mean friction angles per point. The highest friction angle we see is in the elk subterrain, and we can see that there's some pretty high strength materials in this region, which is generally comprised of smaller failures. The lowest we see is in the Colebrook Schist. There's not a lot of stuff past 35 degree friction angle, and the mean friction angle is about 18 degrees. This area tends to be full of earth flow terrain and complexes, and we can kind of see that it's likely in quite a residual state with uh, maybe a high clay content that might result in low friction angles. Commonly, what people do, well, outside of the geotech realm at least, they'll often look, they'll do regional uh, uh, landslide analyses, and probably the most common way to do it, which in my opinion is inappropriate, is doing the infinite slope analysis. Here, we compare basically for each site the three-dimensional effects of forensics and how they differ from the infinite slope analysis. The red lines represent what uh, a lot of people would get if they used the infinite slope, which would not be appropriate, of course. The black lines represent our bounds for saturated dry conditions, and we scatter the data here. We see significantly lower friction angle estimates than you'd get using what a lot of, say, uh, uh, a lot of the geolo geology community is using. So with that said, uh, what, so one thing we're working on is susceptibility, and what we're doing is applying the same approach, but instead of doing it backwards through back analysis, we're applying it forwards through predictive modeling. And what we do is we apply the same approach by looking for unstable cells, and then eventually growing from there, cells, until we achieve equilibrium using a 3D slope stability analysis. Um, what we get is 
reasonable shapes, at least at this point, of, of possible landslides. You can see here's a, a, one of our analyses for um, entire regions. It's a work in progress, but it's meant to just be first order planning, uh, particularly with our state transportation department and our geological survey. So with that said, I went through a bit fast, but everybody probably wants to get on with their day. Um, by combining some of our, our theory from geotech, from geology, in practice with, with some of the geospatial tools we have now, uh, LIDAR can be really helpful. It allows us to produce really informative landslide inventories. These are going to only get better with time and with the data that we're collecting uh, throughout the U.S. There's an initiative in the U.S. to collect LIDAR uh, throughout the, at least the contiguous 48 states. And when this happens, I think it's going to be a, a godsend to many people in our practice. Um, we've talked about creating methods for reasonable volume estimates for a series of deep-seated landslides, which are often difficult to predict. Now, these are first-order estimates, um, but they do tend to follow similar trends to what's been observed for evacuated landslides. But we can still mark nuanced differences between some of the bigger features and some of the smaller features. Um, these regional landslide back analyses aren't necessarily intended to give you a friction angle to work with, but they do give you an idea of what you're working with in a region and what might be associated with certain landforms. You know, we can see again that some of these larger earth flow features, they, they have lower friction angles ranging from, you know, 5 to 20 degrees V. Um, some of the, the more deep-seated rotational failures tend to have higher shear strengths. And this gives us information relevant for making decisions at the planning level, uh, the regional landslide stability, susceptibility, hazard, risk, and the likes of that. So with that said, um, I very much appreciate everybody being here, and, and uh, I'll take a couple questions. Of course, I'd also like to acknowledge some of my colleagues. It's really, it's really more their work than it is me. I'm just happy to advise and work with them. So with that said, I see uh, the inbox has spiked red, and I'm just seeing if there's any questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Any questions? Okay. Well, with that said, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for being here uh, this morning. Um, we really hope you enjoyed our presentation. Uh, remember, tomorrow and the next day, there will be further sessions on embankment dams and slopes, and they're sure to be good. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers today. They've done a great job. And, uh, of course, ASCE for, for helping arrange this. Um, and last, I'd like to thank Keller again for, for sponsoring this webinar. Um, it's been great, and I wish you all a great day. Thank you again.